today's message um, I've been trying to give it a title it's still rumbling in my spirit but I think that we'll try to make something of it our concentration is going to be on the book of Job the book of Job and I want us to read a scripture in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number four. Um, I think we'll be looking at uh, 13 to 16. Just give me a moment. Um, 14. 14. Hebrews 4 from verse number 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need I'm going to read it also from the Amplified Bible. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liabilities to the assaults of temptation but the one who has been tempted in every respect as we are yet without sinning let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good times for every need appropriate help and well-timed help coming just when we need it. Amen. And then go with me to the book of Job. They said that Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. The author is not known. Some say it's Moses. Others say it's uh, Solomon. The authors may begin, can continue to argue who wrote the, the book. But the name Job means the hated or persecuted one. So this morning, my message is going to be on attitudes in pain and suffering. I don't know if that's an appropriate title, but that's what comes to my mind for now. Attitudes in pain and suffering. I said Job means the hated or persecuted one. Amen. So we're going to kind of read through the scriptures. Of course, we can't do all 42 chapters. Is it 42 chapters or 20? Hallelujah. But there was a man in the land of Oz whose, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. So this was his description. Blameless, upright, 
feared God, shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, and so it goes on. The man was wealthy. So it says, so this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He had 10 children. He was wealthy. He feared God. He walked blamelessly before God. He shunned evil. And when his sons would go and feast in their houses, they loved parties. Not strange for young people. Each on his appointed day and will send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job will send and sanctify them and he will rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. That's Job did regularly. It's interesting that he didn't teach his children to pray. He did the praying all by himself. He carried the burden of his children even in their adult life. Um, well, in my reasoning, I don't think that it was the best of example because at a point you may cease to exist. And if you train your children, then they can carry on the tradition. But he did what a lot of people don't do. A lot of men, a lot of people don't do, taking their time to pray for their children. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. It's always so interesting. God always asks questions he already has the answers for. But he always asks the question. He knew where Satan had been. Amen. But he asked him the question anyway. And he says, going back and forth through the earth. Okay? Now some find it strange that Satan should come into the presence of God. The sons of God are often referred to as the angels. And uh, this is a true account. I love the Bible. I always tell by people that the Bible is a true book. It speaks about the good the bad, the ugly. It just tells the story as it is, not trying to um, paint a certain picture, but makes it real. You get it? Because some people like, you know, how can and how could and how can, but that's the reality of what it is. Okay? So the Bible tells us that these angels and Satan so um, the Lord said to Satan, verse 8, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household? Around all that he has on every side, you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So this dialogue is going on between God and Satan in heaven. Job was not present. God was bragging about Job. His heart was pleased with Job because of the way he lived 
his life. And so he's telling Satan, have you observed, you know, have you observed my servant? See how he, you know, he shuns evil, he fears God, he walks blamelessly. And Satan says, oh, it's because of you. You have protected him. You have provided for him. You have made him a great man. That's why he does the things that he does. And the Lord says to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Beloved, for me, this is always a very encouraging that Satan can do nothing without the explicit knowledge of God. Amen? Sometimes we believe that Satan is just a loose cannon and can do whatever he wants to do. But we know that he can do nothing without the knowledge of God. And sometimes this is what beats people. There are a lot of people who say, okay, we Christians say, God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. We say God is good all the time. Why is there evil? Why is there suffering? Why is there pain? And this question of why there is suffering has challenged the beliefs of many people to the extent that there are people who just refuse to believe in God because there cannot be this being out there who is all-knowing, who is sovereign, who is good, and yet evil exists. And so that argument goes on. And the argument of why do good people suffer? Because this man, as far as his, can I call it, his personality description by God, is a man who feared God, who lived upright. It's a man who did what he could do. And God was proud of him. But see the dialogue behind the scene. We have 2020 vision. We have the ability to read this story. But Job did not know the discussion going on in heaven between God and Satan. So when Satan tells God, it's because of all you've done for him. That's why he's serving you. That's why he's worshipping you. You remove those things and he will curse you to your face. So he threw a challenge. Amen. Beloved, a lot of times the battles we go through are bigger and higher than ourselves because light and darkness, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are engaged. We are caught in the middle. Okay? We're caught in between. Not because we desired it. Not because we want it. But because of what is going on. And that is because if you don't get the story of the fall of man. That which happened in Genesis chapter 3. If you don't get that story. That when God created this perfect world. There was an entity. An archangel. Who in his days in heaven was called Lucifer. 
Some say Lucifer. Lucifer. But Lucy, light. He was a light bearer. Yes, yeah, so now you have some deceptive people. You know, there, there was a trust that was set up in the UK several years ago. When they started off, it was Lucifer Trust and people were like, hey, how can you name? So they just switched the name to Lucy Trust. Lucy Trust. That they knew what they were about. Okay? So, there are people who believe that Lucifer is the legitimate heir to the throne of God not Jesus okay not Jesus, Lucifer and so there are those devotees to see that Lucifer takes the place of honor That's for another day. Hallelujah. But you see from this story that God told the devil, Satan, how far he could go. Okay? How far he could go. He said you can touch all that he has. So, Satan goes on the rampage. And it's so interesting, this story, because you, you cannot imagine what took place in the life of Job. From verse 13. Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and Consume them. I alone escaped to tell you while he was still speaking. Another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, killed, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking. In their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness. And struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people. And they are dead. I alone escaped to tell you. Someone says when it rains it pours. Back to back to back. The problems were just you know, coming like that. To losing all. And then finally his children. I don't know who has ever been through that pain. But in this pandemic, people have lost five members of their family. People have lost father, mother, brother, sister, friends, and it keeps going on. The death count we had at a point was over 3 million. I don't even know what it is now because now they don't put them up as they used to do. Death all around us. And you see that the, the devil has the power to motivate behind the scenes drive people to do the things they do. That's why we learned from Ephesians 
chapter number 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You see, those Serbians and Chaldeans and whatever were used by the devil. Amen? To devastate this man. He was able to mobilize the wind to bring a, a, a draft from the, the desert, the wilderness to come and, and blow down the house where his sons and daughters were and kill them. So I know that the storm where Jesus had told the disciples, let's go to the other side. That storm was not an ordinary storm. The devil wanted to, and several times he tried to kill Jesus before his time. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 5 that he, in the days of his flesh, with strong tears, he cried unto him that could deliver him. Because several times they tried to kill him before his time, so he would not fulfill his mission. These are the modus operandi of the devil. Bible says, let us not be ignorant of his devices. Least he takes the advantage. He takes advantage of us. Hallelujah. And so some of the things you are contending with, you are looking at physical human beings and, you know, doing things in the flesh. When you may have to be more spiritual and see that the battle. So, when Job heard this, 20, the Bible says Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Who does that? He went into a posture of fasting. You know, that's the thing they, you know, uh, wear sackcloth and ashes. And he said, Naked came I into my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And several times this is quoted at funerals. People quote this. But this is what Job said. Amen. This is what Job said. It doesn't, the, it, it doesn't mean this is what God, because you and I know the background story, that God didn't give and take away. It wasn't God who took away. Are you getting me? In his understanding, it's God who blessed me with everything. That's true. And the same God has taken away. But was it God who took away? It was the devil. Hallelujah. But he didn't know. Just as you and I only know because we're reading this story. Hallelujah. So there are things that we call acts of God. You know, whenever there's, there are disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, this, that, they are described as acts of God. But are they truly acts of God? No. Because you have an enemy that is seeking, I think it's in Ezekiel or Isaiah, either Ezekiel 20, uh, 28 or Isaiah 14, where the Bible says, he has turned the earth into a wilderness. The devil's mission is to destroy to destroy that which God has done. So if you don't get the Genesis story, you cannot understand exactly what is going on. This was Job's declaration. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because when you are standing at the graveside, burying your loved one, and then they tell you the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. How would you feel? You, 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 you may feel anger against God. Why have you taken away 
my loved one. Amen. And the Bible says, in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. That was his attitude. Amen. And Job did not sin and did not charge God with wrong. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. Still, he holds fast to his integrity. Although you have incited me against him to destroy him without cause. That beats my imagination. Beloved, we don't have answers to everything. But here's God saying that you've, you've challenged me to allow you to do these things to this man and yet he still stands in his integrity so Satan answered the Lord and said skin for skin yes all that a man has he will give for his life so it's like oh Job he doesn't mind losing everything losing his uh, riches, losing his children as long as he has his life. <laughs> but stretch forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Hallelujah. He will never never allow you to be tempted beyond that which you are able. Amen. God knows you. God knows me. Amen. And like I said, the devil can do nothing except God gives him permission. Hallelujah. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot shed with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not also accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Lift up your head for a moment. You and I, and I can say I, we've always kind of condemned Job's wife. We've called her a foolish woman for saying what she said. But let's just roll back a bit and really look at what's going on. In a day, all that they had is lost. Her children are lost. Gone, dead. Ten children. And you want to tell me she should have no feelings. Hallelujah. You see, you see that we are all not the same. We all do not react to things the same way. And depending on your level of maturity, 
Obviously from this story, you see that Job had worked with God and had a certain knowledge of God that his wife did not have. Okay? But this was a woman in pain. She's lost everything, lost her children. Then suddenly, she looks at her husband and the man has sores, boils from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. Is he also going to die? What God is this? So sometimes, before you are quick to judge somebody, because of what they say in their struggle. Hallelujah. And we're going to see that right there. Okay? Her solution was, I don't know who this God you are holding on to is. Just curse him and also die. I'm tired. Amen? That's why we have a high priest. Hebrews 4. The Bible says, we have a high priest who is touched with our feelings. You see, sometimes in our charismatic circles, and our faith movement circles, we, we, we sometimes want to behave as if feelings and emotions don't exist. We all have to keep pretending. Yesterday I went into a patient's room. She was not well. Her husband was sitting, she was lying. Her husband was on the bed, like sitting at the edge. So I asked, well, how are you doing? She says, I'm fine. Then the husband said, no, she's not fine. She's very low. She's very down. She's very depressed. You see, it's just so easy many times. Oh, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. How is it? It is well. And it is not well. Because by the fine time I'd finished speaking to them, they asked me to pray and praying for them. The man said, you are just like an angel that walked into this room. We needed you right at this time. Okay. So we have a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses. He was tempted like us but was without sin so we need to run to him so he shows us how to do it okay so we continue the story <laughs> so Satan struck him with boils and his wife says, curse God and die. Then the Bible said, in verse 11, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity, that they came upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliaphas, the Tenamite, Bildad, the Shuba, Shuhite, and Zophar, the Nemanite, Nemathite. For they made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. A good thing. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. Each one tore his robe, sprinkled dust on his head towards heaven. 
So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief was great. Amen. You see two things happening here. His friend's head. And so they decided to come and to be with him, to comfort him. And they did. And when they saw the way he was, they could not, he could not be recognized. How adversity had hit him so bad, he was unrecognizable because he had boils from his head to his feet. He needed to get something to scrape his skin. So they came. They wept. They sat seven days and nights and no one said a word. Beloved, hear me this morning. There are times when people are grieving and when you don't know what to say, shut your mouth. Because sometimes the words that can come out of your mouth can deepen the pain the person is going through. I was having a chat with someone as I was thinking through this message. And she was telling me, yes. When I experienced a death someone came and said ha ah, God forbid parents should not be burying their children it's children who should be burying their so did they do something wrong how dare you Okay? Because you see, when somebody in your life dies, you, you're going through all kinds of emotions. Even when we, we go and we say, it is well. It is well. God is good. Is God good in that? It, you know, the person is trying to make sense of what is going on. So, if you don't know what to say, shut your mouth. Just even being there. Okay? Just holding the person's hand. Just maybe rubbing the person's back. But just sitting in the silence can make a whole lot of difference. Because sometimes we end up saying things we ought not to say. I've heard pastors. Somebody's been involved in a serious accident. And the pastor walks up and he says, It's because you don't pay your tithes. Yeah. We do some of these things without thinking. Okay? Yes. The devourer may happen, but I want you to know there are people who pay their tithes to the T and still get involved in accidents. Life is a mystery. This man had no clue why he was going through what he was going through. In God's eyes, he was perfect. He was blameless. He shunned evil. And there he was suffering. Okay? Pain. Let me write some, read something I saw somewhere. God has purpose for your pain. 
a reason for your struggles. A reward for being faithful. Don't give up. Let me read that again. God has a purpose for your pain. You see, when we come to the understanding that <laughs> it's not all pain that is bad. Because pain is a signal or an indication that something is wrong. Are you hearing me? Pain is an indication. God created that also for a reason. Amen? Two kinds of people. There was a woman who was interviewed. She had a child with a rare medical condition. In fact, there are just a few human beings who have that condition. It's a genetic defect. They don't experience pain. No. They don't experience any pain. And the woman said at the end of her interview, every night when I go to bed, I ask the Lord, please Lord, help my child to experience pain. Someone listening to her would think, maybe her child is very wicked, her child is very mean. No. You know why? If she steps on a rusty nail, if she walks into fire, because she does not feel pain, she will not even know that's a danger. So there are good reasons for pain. Then the second three boys, three young boys who shot a fellow student who was from Australia coming to study in America. When they asked them why did you do that? For fun? We did it for fun. And one of the fathers of this boy said, my son never gets the gravity of the things, the wrong things. They, they, they had no sense of pain. That's the negative. Okay, that's the negative side. So, these three men sat for seven days and seven nights. They wept with him. So, there are two words compassion and empathy. Compassion and empathy. The Bible says there was a time when Jesus was with his disciples and crowds had gathered and he looked and he saw a multitude of people and they looked like sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion and he said I am the Lord of the harvest pray ye the Lord. You see, I'm sure the disciples saw crowd just as those who, you know, all they see is mega, 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 mega church is a mega. And all they see is crowds and the offering that will come and the number of people who have come. But the chief shepherd saw people who were listless. Compassion compassion is when you see the suffering in someone okay and you 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 feel that they are, you feel they are suffering you you kind of wish you could walk with them in their suffering so you seek to do something about their suffering okay 
So they showed compassion. When they heard, they came. They grieved with him. They saw he had great grief. So they didn't say anything. They just sat with him. Empathy is when you walk in the shoes of the person going through what they are going through. Amen. So, I've said over the years, we've insulted Job's wife. We've said all we can about Job's wife. But imagine that in a day, you lose 10 children. You lose everything. Then before your eyes, you see your husband is also dying. Okay. Yeah. And so Jesus wants us to take this cake beyond praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. And begin to see. Okay? And begin to see. So if we continue the story, my time is far spent. But then in chapter 3, they begin to talk. After seven days and seven nights, then they decide to open their mouth. And what happens? They begin to judge Job. You can't say you are good. You can't say, you know, because God will never judge somebody who is good. There must be sin in your life. There must be this and that and this and that. And beloved, when you walk in those shoes, because when someone is going through something, you don't know the full picture. You don't know what's going on beyond what you can see. And typically, what you see with your physical eyes don't tell the full story. And if you care, you want to go deeper. Because I've seen people on their hospital bed crying. And you may think it's the disease. Why they are crying? And maybe they are crying because I remember, you know, when my father died, one of my cousins who was there came and he said, oh, your daddy was crying, he was crying. He kept on saying, who is going to take care of you? So sometimes you, you need to find out what's behind the tears because you may be drawing the wrong conclusion. Okay? You may just be drawing a wrong conclusion. It's not what is there in front of you. It may go deeper. What am I going to do? What's going to happen? Okay? What's going to happen? So these friends spent chapters talking, 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 saying all kinds of things, pontificating, being, you know, uh, uh, religious and spiritual and quoting scriptures, quoting things. In the midst of somebody's grief, somebody walks up and then is asking, ah, your child was so big, did he lose the weight? Did she lose the weight before they died? What, what has that to do with what's at hand? What, what has that to do with what is at hand? The person is dead. You are now coming to ask whether they lost weight or not. As if people who are slim don't die. Let me shut my mouth for now. Shall be continued. 
God bless you.